everyone. My name is Jennifer Sessions. I am the Senior Director of Client Delivery at Diligent Pharma. We are so delighted to have so many of you joining our uh, webinar today titled Identifying Risks for Outsourced Services, a Novel Approach uh, to Provider Qualification. Uh, so to, for today's session, we're going to hear from clinical research industry leaders who will explain how pharma and biotechnology companies are managing the risks of outsourced services and technologies in clinical trials more effectively and efficiently than ever before by using a standardized approach developed by the WCG Avoca Quality Consortium and the online diligent qualification platform. I will be the facilitator of our session today alongside our expert uh, guest speakers, Chris Otto, Christy McDonald, and Jay Turpin. Uh, we will also hear key insights and the why behind today's webinar session as this topic is uh, close to the mind and heart of our CEO, Patty Luchston. During today's session, just a couple of administrative items. Um, as Theodore mentioned, we will be asking uh, several polling questions along the way uh, just to get an idea of your experiences. Uh, please be ready to enter your responses, uh, which will be anonymized, and we'll feed back the results to you straight away. Uh, we will also spend, again, as Theodore mentioned, at the end of our session today, around 10 or 15 minutes uh, with a Q&A segment. Uh, please submit your questions again throughout the webinar and we'll respond to as many as we can, um, if not during today's session, then shortly after the webinar. Um, so before we move to uh, our guest speaker talks, I would like to um, share with you a registration polling question. So just appreciate all of your uh, entries as you registered. Uh, this question was asked, have you ever been involved in a trial that was impacted by an unexpected performance issue by a vendor. So if we remove uh, the people who said this doesn't apply to them in the no segment, your answers were closer to what we expected uh, with 41% saying yes and 36% saying they aren't sure. Uh, so that leaves one in four of you who's, who said that they have not been involved in a trial that was impacted uh, by a uh, unexpected performance issue by a vendor. Uh, but the fact that you're here today and you're listening in indicates you're aware how much a successful trial relies upon good risk management and especially control of risks from vendors. So uh, with that, I am going to move to our first guest speaker. I would like to introduce Chris Otto. Um, Chris is going to share um, the process of outsourcing services at a high level how risks arise and how they are managed within a strategic framework. So Chris, with that, I am going to hand it over to you. Great, thank you, Jennifer. So probably more important than my title really is the experience that I have um, working with third parties, sourcing of work within the pharmaceutical industry, almost 30 years of experience, most of that in large pharma and really working with over a hundred vendors and service providers to enable uh, clinical research. And so with that, what I really want to do is get us grounded in kind of a high level process for outsourcing services in clinical research. And really it starts with the fact that you as a sponsor has a need for services to be provided to enable your clinical research. And oftentimes you'll have a sourcing strategy on whether that work will be performed internally by maybe internal staff or whether or not you'll use third parties uh, to perform those activities. And for the purpose of today's discussion, we've kind of defined providers or, or vendors. They could be traditional CROs, they could be labs, central labs, specialty labs, e-clinical um, vendors, just a myriad of types. So really any vendor or provider that's providing you know, services to enable clinical research. Oftentimes you'll have as a sponsor a sourcing strategy and it could be a provider as well. We'll talk a little bit around providers using third parties um, to augment or enable their capabilities. You'll go through a process of identification and qualification of those vendors. It could be existing vendors that you've utilized but perhaps qualification for new capabilities or new providers or vendors that you've never worked with before. 
Oftentimes, as you've completed the identification and qualification, you'll work, move into contracting, working with procurement, working with legal potentially to complete the contracting together with the vendor provider, um, move into project initiation. And then oftentimes, uh, and we'll talk a little bit more around the project and provider oversight. What are the key dimensions, six dimensions of oversight? And oftentimes the output of your vendor qualification and your contracting and the nature of the work and the, and the services being provided will inform your oversight strategy and plan. You then complete the project and oftentimes the overall kind of life cycle of the project from initiation and contracting all the way through through closeout of the projects will inform your sourcing strategy for new or different clinical trials or clinical research programs and additional services as well. So just wanted to get everyone grounded on kind of a high level process overview. As I mentioned on the previous slide, really six key dimensions of project and provider oversight. We talked a little bit around contracting. So certainly cost and contract management is a, a key component to vendor and provider oversight. Your quality and compliance management strategy Again, the qualification of the vendor, if there are risks identified, we'll talk a little bit around risk management. You could have a quality agreement. Um, you could have CAPAs that are outstanding from your qualification of the vendor. Um, and also your quality management system could inform the requirements around quality and compliance. Obviously project management and performance management of deliverables and ensuring that the vendor and provider uh, meets their commitments as to the services being provided, both in terms of the quality performance, uh, as well as the timeliness of the work that's being performed. Risk management, and we'll talk, and obviously that's a kind of a keystone of the conversation today, is really understanding what risks are potentially gonna manifest themselves in is issues. Um, are you gonna mitigate those risks? How are you gonna mitigate those risks? Um, what's the probability of them manifesting themselves? And how do you quantify uh, issues and risks throughout the life cycle of the trial? And then also relationship management, just to round it out, certainly a key component. It could be defined or influenced by the nature of the relationship with the vendor and provider, how robust that is, how robust your governance model may be, but certainly maintaining that relationship all the way through from pre-qualification identification through project completion and so I just wanted to, again, give you an overview of kind of the six key components of oversight. There could be others that are required per your quality management system and your SOPs, or in many cases, um, these are really gonna be fit for purpose based on the work performed, the capabilities, and the regulatory significance of the, again, the work being provided. So let's talk a little bit around risk management. And I think the key thing is prospectively understanding, you know, your risk and your quality uh, risk tolerance. Again, based on the deliverables and the services that the, that the vendor is providing, as well as kind of conditionally or contextually, what, are, what is the intended use of the work that's being provided? Is it exploratory? Does it inform primary and secondary endpoint? Um, and again, what is required both from a regulatory perspective as well as your internal quality management system. Again, identification of risks um, via the provider and the vendor qualification. You, there may be CAPAs coming out of the qualification process. Uh, the technical qualification could inform performance risks. Um, and so I think it's key that we understand and that you understand, again, whether you're a sponsor or a provider vendor on what the potential risks are. As you quantify and understand the risks, then it comes down to measuring those risks. A, what are, what's the probability of the risks manifesting themselves as issues? If they do manifest themselves, what is the potential impact um, of those, those risks and those issues? And then really making a conscious decision regarding risk mitigation um, or depending on, again, on the nature of the work and the criticality of it, you may decide you're going to go ahead and accept the risk. If the impact is low, if the detection is high, you may decide you're gonna go ahead and accept and or if you do identify uh, the risks, you may go ahead and accept and manage those issues as they come in. And then really the monitoring, the oversight as we just talked about, what is your internal process for issue management? If you've got issues that manifest themselves through risks that, that were identified or potentially not identified on 
uh, planned and unquantified risks early on? And what is your process for management and reporting through quality oversight, through governance, through relationship management with those vendors? And then typically at the end, you have got ongoing quality governance throughout the life cycle of the engagement and the project. And oftentimes then you may decide you're gonna do an audit once the, pro the project is completed to really look at the cumulative quality of performance, the performance of the vendor and the third party, um, and making sure then that that will inform future sourcing strategy, uh, future utilization of that particular vendor or provider or others within your overall sourcing strategy. So really it's critical, particularly as we talk about risk management today, to keep kind of the risk management framework um, in, in the top of mind relative to all the way through understanding prospectively your risk and quality tolerance limits through active management mitigation acceptance and then post uh, you know, deliverables, potentially audits um, to inform future assessments and work as well. The other thing is we've talked about qualification, oversight, and audit. I think oftentimes sponsors and, and even providers and vendors view these in isolation. And so one of the key things we want to enforce today is really the interrelatedness of these stages and the relationships. You know, certainly as we talked about sourcing strategy, you know, moving into qualification of providers um, or new capabilities at existing providers, again, based on qualification standards and the technical requirements associated with the work, the active oversight, which again, will be informed by your qualification and the output. Um, if you've got capital items, if you've got risks, again, that certainly is a key component of that oversight, making sure that you've got risk tolerance limits um, and your ability to effectively manage risks and provide adequate oversight throughout the trial and then again, audit, right? Based on the oversight, the issues and the risks and the issues that have manifested themselves, the inputs around qualification then um, will have an impact on the scope and the approach relative to the audit, whether it be an ongoing in-process audit or an audit kind of after the work has been complete and making sure that um, you evaluate, right, the work, evaluate the risks. Did you quantify and identify them prospectively and how did they manifest themselves throughout the trial um, and the activities or the program? And then again, how does that influence and inform future work either with the same vendors and providers or even beyond that relative to informing quality management systems, uh, risk management and risk tolerance? And so again, those are very interrelated and I think common, you know, a common misconception is viewing these in isolation rather than interrelated stages and relationships. So with that, then hopefully that provides you with a little bit of an overview of both in terms of the life cycle of outsourcing um, oversight that can and should be provided as well as risk management. So let's move to our first poll question. And so I'm gonna go ahead and read this. If, if you think about the last new service provider or vendor that you used, how did you qualify and assess them prior to use? Um, and again, you can click more than one box on here. And again, I think this question applies both to pharma sponsors as well as um, you know, providers and vendors that perhaps use third parties to either augment or enable the capabilities that they provide. So let's go ahead, um, for those of you that are uh, attending this today, today, go ahead and, uh, and answer this question and uh, we'll take a look at the poll results. So it looks like we've got um, you know many many uh, individuals that have uh, kind of completed this. Um, Jennifer, I don't know if we have a. I see the percentages. I'm not sure if we've got the number. Uh, and I'll give you a few more seconds to go ahead and kind of complete this. Yeah, Chris, it breaks it out by percentage, not actual number. Okay. And again, if you're looking at this, um, obviously the, the total percentages will equal more than 100% because we gave you the opportunity to click you know, more than one box. Um, and so I suspect, again, whether you be a sponsor or a vendor provider, perhaps you're using a mixed model, right? In some cases you're using in-house teams 
or external consultants or quality auditors. It looks like the overwhelming uh, number of you are using kind of in-house teams um, with obviously second here using an external consultant or uh, quality auditor. And I suspect in many cases, perhaps you're using a combination of, of both, uh, but certainly informative as we take a look at certainly your utilization uh, across those capabilities. So thank you for uh, completing that poll question. And at this time, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, we're gonna transition. I'm gonna turn it over uh, to Chrissy McDonald. Uh, Chrissy's gonna kind of provide you an overview. As, as you heard in the opening, Chrissy McDonald is the Vice President for Client Delivery at WCG Avoca. And so Chrissy, go ahead and take it away. Thank you. Thanks so much for the intro, Chris. As you stated, I'm Chrissy McDonald. I lead client delivery at WCG Avoca, which is both the Avoca Quality Consortium um, and then our consulting and research services. So to start today, I actually just wanted to provide a little history on how qualifying vendors really relates to risks in clinical trial execution. And ultimately, why did we, the Avoca Quality Consortium, create these qualification standards? So when the consortium was founded back in 2011, it was founded actually based on the year prior's industry research that showed a large disparity in the quality of work that sponsors thought that they were receiving versus the quality of work that providers thought that they were providing. And because of that, the first deliverable for the consortium was the quality agreement that just really level set the expectations of what sponsors were looking for from their vendors. And followed by that was a lot of work really in the vendor oversight space. Um, but it wasn't long after that, that there was a request from consortium members to even further sort of define the definition of quality by developing provider qualification standards. And if you think about the regulatory landscape at that time, it's when there was a bunch of 483s being handed out to some very large pharmas and some regulatory scrutiny, particularly in the vendor oversight space. And what's one of the key components of vendor oversight, as we talked about earlier with Chris, is actually qualifying and selecting those vendors. So when we embarked on this work stream within the consortium is with the kind of shared goal of standardizing these RFIs in order to reduce time spent by not only sponsors, but also CROs and providers in developing and completing unique RFIs for each customer but also to shorten the timeframes and onboarding um, to really drive efficiency by sharing and updating those standards uh, collectively. So nobody was reinventing a wheel. So despite the fact that this was the initial or original rationale, over the years, the work stream has served quite a few additional purposes. And most recently in the innovation space, um, and looking at new technology providers. So with the launch of the innovation engine as part of the AQC, one of the key findings that we found both through our industry research and conversations with um, lead executives was that a lot of times the reason some of these new technologies weren't being deployed at scale within a sponsor organization is really because they weren't sure of what good looked like and what good looked like in terms, of, in terms of qualifying these vendors. What were the expectations? What were regulators going to look to them to oversee and to ensure that these vendors were capable of doing um, prior to them utilizing them on a clinical trial? And through a formalized process of developing these qualification tools, we were able to outline what good looks like, not only from the regulatory and compliance space, but also from a quality and industry expectations standpoint. So the process that you can see here of how we develop these tools was really developed by an amazing senior consultant at Avoca. Her name's Janice Hall. Um, and the process, as with anything, starts with defining scope. So what's in scope, what's out of scope? Um, if they outsource it, what do they need to understand about the provider and the staff? as well as what challenges are companies currently having to date with qualifying these prevent, uh, providers. Um, and sometimes those challenges are just the simple fact that there aren't any regulatory guidances out there. So what are the sponsor companies thinking about? What is the industry thinking about in terms of risks and concerns that they wanna make sure are addressed 
when they're looking at what these companies are capable of. Um, the other key point here of what do we do when we're confirming the scope is that defined piece. We have to make sure that we're all speaking the same language when we're developing these qualification standards. You can look at things like DCT, which oftentimes has a different meaning from one organization to another. So we wanna make it abundantly clear what we are looking at and what we aren't for each of these standards so that they um, can be leveraged in the most appropriate way. Ultimately, once the scope is defined, uh, Avoca conducts some research with their subject matter experts really to find source content for the standards. As I said, it can be global regulations and guidelines. It may be conference presentations. It may be white papers, sometimes even industry interviews with providers, sponsors who are using these types of technologies. Um, and sometimes it's even RFI materials that are donated by member companies. But once that information's collected, we develop that standard. Um, and the best part of the AQC is that all of those materials that are developed are peer reviewed prior to being published in the Knowledge Center. So once that standard's finalized, it gets sent out for that peer review by their industry peers and executives. And we look for three independent reviewers. So it's not just one opinion being taken into consideration. So when the tools finalized, all the necessary feedbacks addressed, the standards then get mapped to that RFI, the scorecard, and ultimately the visit report, which are again, drafted, peer reviewed, and published to the Knowledge Center for use. Um, but as I said earlier, one of the goals of the qualification tools and all of the other tools within the Knowledge Center is really to drive efficiency in the industry and to prevent that reinvention of the wheel. And one of the ways we're able to do that is because we ensure that those tools and standards and templates that are within the uh, Knowledge Center um, are current with regulatory updates and changes um, based on, again, not only those regulatory changes, but industry expectations, leading practices, um, and even sometimes just case studies and insights that we're hearing from conversations of what people are getting dinged for in regulatory inspections, et cetera. So all of the tools in that Knowledge Center go through this robust change control process. We meet twice monthly and we review and evaluate all of the items that are brought to light based on any of those potential changes I just discussed. Um, and any change gets assigned and updated in a prioritized fashion where those regulatory items obviously go to the top of the list. Um, and then member suggestions are vetted through the leadership advisory board meetings or ultimately other SME assessments. So all of those tools that are in the Knowledge Center are kept up to date based on these. Um, just an example of some of the regulatory guidance documents you can see here. Um, but for those of you who are a member of the consortium, that list can always be found in the AQC regulatory references resource section of the Knowledge Center which shows you not only all of the regulatory references we've reviewed and updated the tools for, but also the ones that are in the wings, things like draft guidance documents that we're waiting to be finalized before we update those. Um, again, we've talked a lot about the consortium today. If you're not a consortium member and you're interested in finding out more, don't hesitate to reach out to me after the meeting. I'm happy to provide you some additional information but with that, before I hand it to Jay to talk about how Diligent really leverages the power of those AQC qualification standards, I wanna take a minute to ask another polling question about how many clinical research, um, or excuse me, how many clinical research provider qualifications have you initiated over the last 12 months? So none, you're still working with the same people, one to nine, 10 to 49, 50 to 99, 100 or more, which if it's 100 or more, my goodness, you are busy. Or last but not least, I'd rather not say. Get some results coming in here now. So it looks like a majority, well, maybe not a majority, about half are in that one to nine and a quarter of you are in that 10 to 49 range. That's a pretty substantial amount of qualifications in a year. If you sort of divide that across 12 months, you're looking at at least almost one a month, if not more. 
But with that, I will pass it to Jay to talk to uh, you about how really Diligent can leverage the power of those qualification standards, um, as well as minimize some of the time spent on those 10 to 49 qualification that are doing it here. Thank, thank you very much, Chrissy. Appreciate um, your insights. And, and thanks, Chris, as well, for setting the context for how this all fits together with regard to vendor oversight and management of risk. Um, just to introduce myself, I'm the head of client services for Diligent Pharma. Um, before that, I spent over 30 years in the pharmaceutical industry uh, at a major pharma. And uh, I, I've also had the privilege of working with many different vendors. Uh, many of those collaborations were very successful. And unfortunately, as, as many of you have experienced, sometimes those uh, relationships were challenging because performance didn't match up to expectations. So uh, we're really excited about what we've come together to deliver from a diligent pharma perspective. Um, you know, given the leadership of Patty Lushton, our founder and CEO, you know, we really tried to rethink things in, in a new way and, and introduce our way to manage the vendor profiles and the vendor qualification process. Traditionally, every sponsor goes out and qualifies every one of their providers and that gets repeated with minor variations from sponsor to sponsor. And this is obviously a lot of work for the sponsors to get auditors out to, to cover qualification. It's also a lot of work on the provider side to actually host these provider uh, qualification assessments. What we've done is really try to rethink this whole process and make it smarter, make it more efficient and improve the cycle times to get this accomplished and, and also ultimately utilize the standards that Chrissy talked about from the AQC to actually improve the quality of this process for each of our clients. Uh, the way ultimately our model works is we qualify a provider upon the request of a sponsor. And once that qualification is completed and placed on our cloud-based platform, a second sponsor and a third sponsor can request that content and it uh, won't have to be repeated. We don't have to go through the exercise again. And there's a huge, huge time savings um, in terms of resources and cycle times when work is reused. So uh, a qualification assessment can be re reused and actually save you know, many, many uh, months uh, of time by sponsors two and three. And ultimately it reduces the amount of assessments that a provider has to actually host, uh, bringing benefits to both sponsors and providers. Th this ultimately helps you as a, as a pharmaceutical sponsor, optimize your team. Uh, you can actually make sure you're asking the right questions regarding a new vendor that might be providing a service that you're interested in to support your team. It can reduce costs. Um, it can actually um, allow you to dedicate your internal resources to activities that of highest value uh, to you internally and then allow us to support you with your, the qualification activities uh, through our team, through our contract auditors that can actually conduct this assessment for you. And as Chris mentioned, and, and Chrissy also touched on, you know, this helps you manage risk. Um, the foundation of everything we do is on the AQC qualification standards. And those standards are maintained and updated uh, on a, a timely way and a timely basis. And so it does rep represent the current regulatory requirements around the globe, as well as leading practices that the members of the AQC um, have highlighted as important to manage that type of vendor. And as Chrissy has mentioned, we have several new e-technology, uh, emerging technology um, categories that we also support. And uh, through the pandemic, it's actually uh, helped us support companies that are driving virtual clinical trials or decentralized clinical trials and the use of new e-technologies in clinical research and help them ask the right questions uh, about the, those capabilities, making sure that those vendors are prepared to support the clinical trial uh, throughout its uh, initiation, conduct, and, and wrap up and completion, and, and also put you in a position where you're inspection ready um, 
going forward. So how do we do that? Um, so we leverage the qualification standards that come out of the Avoca Quality Consortium. At the heart of this, there's a set of core standards that we apply to every third party vendor. Uh, it applies, it, it covers the common areas of things like privacy, things like um, third party management, how do they handle uh, physical security, uh, computer system security, um, how do they handle data integrity through the movement of data throughout the, the work that they perform. And then we add to that core standard technical or functional qualification standards that apply to their business. So if you're a CRO, you know, we're looking in the upper left quadrant, uh, things like monitoring data management, biostatistics, and others that might be a part of a full service CRO's product offerings. If you're a lab or an imaging company, we may be looking in the lower left quadrant and we have qualification standards in those areas. If you're an e-technology company, the upper right quadrant covers the, the types of qualification standards we have in that area. And then coming soon, um, the AQC has a series of new RFI categories, new qualification standards that are under development that as soon as those are completed, go through the review process that Chrissy mentioned, we will then incorporate those into our diligent process going forward. So we assemble um, an approach for vendor qualification based on the services that are being provided by that vendor. So at the foundation is the qualification standard and from that standard, then there is an RFI template that the AQC creates. That RFI template is a series of focused questions that ask about the topics outlined in the AQC standard. So uh, we ask vendors to complete these RFIs. Um, you might call them a pre-qualification questionnaire those questionnaires are part of a documentation package we assemble for our clients. So some of our clients only want the RFIs as documentation. Others want the RFI plus an auditor led assessment to be conducted. And in those cases, we will send an auditor to or do a virtual assessment of a vendor. And at the conclusion of that assessment, they will write a report that that vendor qualification assessment report is aligned with the AQC qualification standards and serves as documentation that a vendor is qualified. The other thing that we've expanded on our service is we actually have um, provided to clients a, a, what we call a premium service where we actually not only ensure that the RFIs get completed, but we take it one step further and actually review that content and try to highlight for them whether that that um, response is appropriate or if there's some level of risk that they should be aware of. And so we've actually created uh, uh, this premium scoring example you see here where we actually ask the client, first of all, to weight which of these categories are high, medium, low in terms of their own perception of risk. Uh, and then um, we then, in effect, read and and judge the the responses. If the if the responses are adequate, we, they get a green rating. If we see some minor gaps, we rate them yellow. And if there's some significant gaps, we actually highlight those as red. That ultimately comes together to an aggregated risk score. And our clients have actually commented back that this is a huge time saver for them, and it helps their staff uh, narrow their focus time. Uh, to, to focus on the highest areas of risk. And this has been well received by our client groups as a way for them to then narrow in their focus on the highest perceived risks uh, for their particular company uh, as they engage with a new vendor. So I have a question, a polling question we'd like for you to answer. Um, which provider service categories are the most difficult for you to qualify or understand. Um, so as, as, a, as a sponsor, which of these are the most difficult to qualify? Is it the CRO, functional, the functional services with including phase one? Is it laboratory services um, such as central labs, biomarker labs, bioanalytical labs, imaging services, e-clinical? So if you could uh, take a look at these uh, 
questions and mark which one you see as the most difficult. You can tick more than one option, and we'll take a look at the results. Okay, uh, looking at the results, it looks like uh, the, the most um, challenging area is e-clinical and mobile technical providers, and that is very consistent with what we've seen with our clients. Um, there's a lot of new providers in this space, a, a lot of new technologies being introduced, and uh, we, we've had a large uptake in our services in this area. And we have been able to uh, evaluate many different types of e-clinical vendors offering new technologies to clinical trials. So that's the largest. Also, um, emerging technologies like e-learning um, and artificial intelligence is, is a companion challenge, I think, because of the newness. And frankly, there's an, oftentimes there's a limited amount of regulations in this space. And then behind that is CROs and imaging services. So this is actually quite consistent with what we've seen uh, in our clientele and, and the work that we've been performing here at Diligent Pharma. So thank you for your answers. Next, I'd like to introduce our founder and CEO, Patty Lushton. Patty and her visionary uh, leadership has both founded Avoca, the Avoca Group and the Avoca Quality Consortium and has expanded that into what we do at Diligent Pharma. So, Patty, uh, welcome, and uh, let you uh, take it from here. Thank you so much, Jay, and thank you all for attending. Um, as you're thinking of your questions and adding them to uh, to the uh, Q and A list here, I'll just uh, sort of wrap things up by saying, um, you know, as Chrissy was kind of talking about the origins of uh, the qualification standards, I had a flashback to our very first uh, quality consortium meeting in May of 2012. And during that meeting, there was a segment where we talked about common industry challenges. And the whole uh, challenge around qualifying providers totally dominated that conversation. And I, I was very struck by it because we had executives describing how they needed to sort of get in a queue to be able to qualify providers that they're interested in just because sponsors inundating uh, these providers with qualification assessments. And of course, fast forward 10 years, a decade, so much has happened in the last 10 years. Um, first of all, this body of work that the AQC has done around standards has just added so much value uh, to, to our industry. The other thing that's happened is there of um, has exploded. So, so our system has become much more complex. And, you know, Jay talked about just the sort of the challenge and the dysfunction with every single sponsor uh, qualifying every single vendor and how, um, you know, how difficult that is both for sponsors and providers. It's also actually difficult for auditors as well because, you know, auditors are having you know, deal with many different uh, tools and, you know, working with um, and sponsors need to find the right capabilities of these auditors in the right geographies. Uh, so it leads to incredible inefficiency. When you think about just the, um, the, the, the number of um, requests, the number of RFIs, the number of uh, VQAs and requalifications, that compounds uh, the dysfunction. A couple of years ago, uh, Jay Turpin and I worked with Ken Getz and the team at Tufts to characterize what this all means for our industry. And you know, the the I guess the punchline of is that it's a highly fragmented. Uh, siloed part of the clinical trial execution process, um, and some of these numbers that, that are um, that are on the screen were actually uh, 
determined by, by the research that we did with Tufts. The other thing that uh, we identified with the Tufts research was just the amount of time it takes. So, um, you know, over 100 days often to, to be able to uh, fully qualify a clinical service provider. Um, so, you know, earlier Jen said that this whole topic is uh, near and dear to my heart. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm very excited about what the platform, really for a couple reasons. One, I've, you know, been in this industry for, for decades. And, um, you know, there are a number of areas that need to be addressed this one in particular, though, has such downstream effects, you know, by um, all of the, you know, the redundancy and the delays in the early part of the clinical trial execution process, it just um, lengthens the amount of time it takes to, uh, to conduct a trial, which in, at the end of the day prevents medicines from getting to patients as quickly as possible. And I can't think of anything that is more important uh, that we should all be focusing on in our industry in terms of um, just our, our need to support patients. And so with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to, to Jen Sessions and we'll go through some of the questions that, that have come in. And thank you again for, um, for participating in our webinar today. Thank you, Patty. Hi, hi again, everyone. Um, just introducing the, the Q&A segment. Uh, we've had a great response in terms of questions uh, thus far. We have about 15 minutes left in our session, so please continue to submit your questions. Uh, we'll get to as many of them as we can in the remaining time um, and, the, and thereafter. We will um, be certain to provide responses to them. So um, let's go ahead and get started with uh, the Q&A. Um, actually, this first question is for Chrissy. Um, Chrissy, this is kind of a, a two-fold question. Um, how widely recognized are WCG Avoca standards, and um, how, how are the suggestions for new standards brought forward to the AQC? Both great questions. I'm just going to go backwards there in answering them. So suggestions get brought forward in a couple of different ways, primarily through the Leadership Advisory Board, so a group of people passionate about the area and change that come and bring forward their needs. Um, that creates a list of interest from our members that then goes out. Um, we do what's called a pulse survey every year to really help understand um, because when you talk about how widely recognized they are, again, we have over 200 member companies within the consortium. So we want to make sure that the uh, tools that we're developing meet the needs of the broadest uh, group of membership. So, yeah. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, this next question actually is for Chris. So, um, uh, Essentially, you have a new vendor that has passed all qualification steps in an audit. You still have a gut feeling this vendor will prove to be a bad fit for your organization. Is it better to go with your gut or the results of the qualification? And we've received this question um, several times and maybe worded a little differently as well, Chris, around uh, is diligent effectively an extension of a sponsor's organization qualification function to handle end-to-end -end qualification activities, so kind of interrelated. Can you can you respond to this one? Yeah. So this is a, you know a great question, and I think there's a couple of key dimensions to this. The first one being the quantitative qualitative component, and certainly right there needs to be some element or component of both. I think as it relates to diligent being an extension of the sponsor, obviously as it relates to contracting and third-party oversight, the sponsor is ultimately accountable. Um, but I think the diligent qualification and use of third parties for qualification services can enable two or three things with the sponsor. A, if you've got a quality management system at the sponsor that requires a qualification, perhaps right, diligent providing that capability that could could enable compliance to your internal QMS around uh, vendor qualification. The second thing is the output of that diligent qualification could and should inform your oversight. We talked about several key dimensions 
of oversight, it should inform your risk management and your compliance management as well as um, you know, your performance management if there are things that came out of the qualification uh, that need more scrutiny, issues management, risk management. So certainly that would be a second component. And the third one is as you think through audits, right? If you've got a gut feeling that, gosh, you know, as I look at the qualification output, if I look at the services to be provided, um, even the quantification and oversight and management of risks, um, you know, you could decide that you're gonna accelerate an in-process audit really to give you a level of reassurance or to validate the nature of your concern around performance and or quality compliance or integrity, making sure that you get the output of that information earlier rather than later. Um, and so I think, the, and, and if I was gonna add one more thing, I would say part of it too is optionality, right? How many other you know, vendors or providers can provide the capabilities for which you need services to provide? And so if this is the only lab in the world, if this is the only you know, e-clinical e provider, uh, DCT provider, you may not have a lot of choices, which means you're gonna have to make a risk-based decision, you know, enhance your oversight to enable um, satisfactory performance and outcomes. But if you have alternatives, perhaps that can inform whether you move forward regardless of the qualitative or quantitative risk. Um, and then, you know, maybe you have no choice but to pursue that particular vendor, again, with the requisite investments and risk management. So I, I think it's not a one size fits all, but I think there are lots of inputs. Uh, but I think you can get to satisfactory outcomes if you look at it through the context of oversight, risk management and optionality. Great, thank you, Chris. Um, this next question, how does the qualification system or process account for differing quality standards or aspects across various sponsors? Jay, I think this might be a good one for you to answer. Sure, sure, thanks. Um, thanks very much, Jennifer. Um, so we utilize the AQC standards and those Avoca Quality Consortium standards are a, a thorough, um, set of expectations that have been reviewed by the Avoca Quality Consortium members. As Chrissy mentioned, um, there's over 200 pharma, biotech, and provider companies that are part of the AQC. Um, those qualification standards actually capture regulatory expectations. If you, if you dive into the details, every qualification statement uh, maps to a particular predicate rule if it exists. If there's a regulation that s speaks to that topic, it it would capture that. And if it's frankly, if it's a leading practice, a best practice in the industry, it also notes that. But um, that AQC standard is widely accepted, um, and really the predicate for this whole business uh, that we're in is is that we have a lot in common that we're all trying to achieve. Some of it's regulatory related, some of it's just industry leading practice. Um, and we stand firmly on the Avoca Quality Consortium standards. Uh, and so far our clients have really appreciated um, that consistency. It helps us you know, do, do our work in a timely way. Um, and, and frankly, we have, you know, we have some mix of clients, some have very clear line of sight to all the regulations around the world. And sometimes they may not have uh, a line of sight to all the applicable regulations. And our AQC standards actually help them um, open up some blind spots for them. Uh, they didn't know they had to comply with a certain requirement, but the AQC standard uh, helps give them some, uh, shine some light in some areas that they may not have been aware of. So it's widely accepted. Um, you know, Chrissy outlined all the people that are involved in the process of getting those standards completed and, and vetted and approved. Uh, and we found really good receptivity across multiple companies. Thank you, Jay. Uh, this next question is actually for Patty. Uh, who benefits most by us using the diligent qualification platform, sponsors or service providers? You can comment on that, Patty. Oh, well, um, gosh, I think that both sponsors and service providers benefit, but in different ways. Um, you know, if you think about just 
being a provider these days with the, um, you know, the level of outsourcing uh, increasing so significantly and having to respond to so many um, requests for information and fill out all those some of them are on um, cumbersome Excel spreadsheets. Um, uh, that's one aspect of, of challenge that uh, that diligent addresses by for providers because they only have to fill the you know the the questionnaire out once and then sponsors can access that information. I think maybe even the harder part for providers is having to host so many vendor qualification assessments because it's not just a sponsor showing up and you know uh there's there's preparation there's team members that have to be assembled i remember a conversation with um a leader of larger CROs who said that um they uh estimated that they they host 300 visits a year so you can imagine the expense for providers. Um, so the provider community um, uh, benefits significantly by the centralization of the qualification practices. For sponsors, it's really about, you know, as Jay mentioned, it's about speed, it's about, um, you know, efficiencies around cost, but it's also about risk mitigation. Um, and so, you know, it's it's hard to say who benefits more because they do benefit each in um, in different ways. Yeah. Thank you, Patty. Uh, this next question is actually for Chrissy. Uh, patient engagement, uh, P PROs and patient interviews, et cetera, has become an important part of clinical trials. Uh, do we have plans on adding standards in this area? Yeah, that's been brought up and it's certainly something that we'll look at. I think the key there is really defining what we mean by that. There are a lot of different ways to in, uh, engage with vendors from a patient engagement standpoint. So yeah, I think anybody who's interested in that, we'd love to have your voice at the Leadership Advisory Board to talk about what's most important. Perfect. All right, this next question is for Jay. Uh, based on your experience, how long uh, is a qualification effectively valid, knowing that we are in a very dynamic world and systems, people, and processes change quickly? Uh, just, just your thoughts and comments on, on that, um, Jay? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so we do conduct these assessments. We document them in reports, and they are made available to our clients. Um, I think effectively, it looks like about a year they they stay fresh. Um, but the way our business model works, we actually allow our clients to request new assessments if they prefer to not use existing reports, and we can refresh, do a, do a second qualification assessment on a vendor as requested. Uh, you know, one of the one of the things that we uh, have to address is every pharmaceutical company has a different quality management system. Um, and they approach this topic of qualification in different ways. We have some clients that require requalification every two years, every three years. Some only qualify once, and then they move a vendor into an audit schedule. Uh, and instead of requalifying, they just put them on, a, on an audit schedule on a periodic basis, whether that's every year, every two years, every three years. So we try to flex with the needs of each of our clients' quality management system, but in practical terms, it's probably gonna be fresh for about a year and then likely gonna need to be repeated uh, to accommodate any changes to their QMS, the vendor's QMS, or you know, the other as aspect is we see a lot of mergers and acquisitions in the vendor space. And so as they incorporate different business lines and uh, merge as companies between between companies, we need to go back out and take a look at their capabilities after uh, the assimilation of one company within another. Perfect. Thank you, Jay. I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions. Uh, this next question is for Chris. Uh, what is the standard timing for a supplier qualification uh, prior to award of contracting or in parallel, it would be difficult to qualify every provider being considered during an RFP process. Um, it makes sense no, to pre-qualify 
So maybe your comments on the, the timeline for that, Chris? Yeah, so, no, great question. I, I think to the question specifically, right? Yeah, obviously, if you're going to do an RFI and an RFP and you've got a, a large volume, um, I, I would strongly suggest prior to contracting an award, you will want to complete the, the vendor qualification assessment because A, a um, you know, once you complete contracting from a sponsor perspective, you're going to lose some leverage relative to ensuring that the requisite quality considerations that came out of your qualification are adequately incorporated into that contracting process. So, for example, if you complete the qualification, a number of CAPAs or quality or risks that may exist within the service provider and vendor, you will want to incorporate that into your contracting process, i.e. a quality agreement, i.e. performance metrics and KPIs, um, and so if you wait until you've completed the contracting process and the award to complete the qualification, your ability to ensure and mitigate risks associated with performance, whether they be quality or performance related, will, will diminish greatly. Um, and so I would say somewhere between casting the net broad for RFIs and RFPs and completing your vendor selection, i.e. awarding contracting, that's the window by which you'll want to initiate and complete the vendor qualification because of the need to have the qualification output inform key stages in your contracting and, and uh, vendor selection. Great. Thank you, Chris. Well, um, actually, guys, I think we're about at the top of the hour. How quickly an hour goes. Um, I just want, want to spend some time. Uh, giving thanks to a lot of folks. Um, thank you everyone for submitting your questions. Um, we certainly invite you to send more questions. Uh, there will be some links available to you following uh, the webinar session today. And for those questions that we weren't able to answer, we will be providing responses to those uh, within the next week. Also, just thanks to our listeners. We really appreciate your engagement, your interest. Um, we will definitely be in touch with you, and we'd be de delighted to talk to you further um, about these topics and uh, how Diligent could uh, potentially help you. Obviously, no obligation, but uh, our contact information uh, are on the screen here in the details. And then also thank you to our guest speakers um, for your excellent talks today, uh, Chris, Chrissy, Jay, and Patty. Really appreciate uh, all your insights and also to our host, Theodore, thank you very much for hosting such a, such a successful webinar today. Again, thank you guys so much. We really appreciate your participation today.